Chapter Seven of a Florida Sketchbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. A Florida Sketchbook by Bradford Torrey. Chapter Seven, on the Saint Augustine Road. One of my first inquiries at Tallahassee was for the easiest way to the woods. The city is built on a hill with other hills about it. These are mostly under cultivation, and such woods as lay within sight seem to be pretty far off, and with the mercury at ninety in the shade, long tramps were almost out of the question. Take the St. Augustine Road, said the man to whom I had spoken and he pointed out its beginning nearly opposite the state capitol. After breakfast I followed his advice, with results so pleasing that I found myself turning that corner again and again as long as I remained in Tallahassee. The road goes abruptly downhill to the railway track, first between deep red gulches, and then between rows of negro cabins, each with its garden of rose bushes. Now early April, in full bloom. The deep sides of the gulches were draped with pendant lantana branches full of purple flowers, or, more beautiful still, with a profusion of fragrant white honeysuckle. On the roadside between the wheel track and the gulch grew brilliant Mexican poppies, with Venus's looking-glass, yellow oxalis, and beds of blackberry vines. The woods of which my informant had spoken lay a little beyond the railway, on the right hand of the road, just as it began another ascent. I entered them at once, and after a semicircular turn through the pleasant paths, amid live oaks, water oaks, red oaks, chestnut oaks, magnolias, beeches, hickories, hornbeams, sweet gums, sweet bays, and long-leaved and short-leaved pines came out into the road again a quarter of a mile farther up the hill they were the fairest of woods to stroll in it seemed to me with paths enough and not too many and good enough but not too good that is to say they were footpaths not roads though afterwards on a sunday afternoon i met two young fellows riding through them on bicycles the wood was delightful. Also, after my two months in eastern Florida, for lying on a slope, and for having an undergrowth of loose shrubbery, instead of a jungle of scrub oak and saw palmetto, blue jays and crested flycatchers were doing their best to outscream one another, with the odds in favor of the flycatchers, and a few smaller birds were singing, especially two or three summer tanagers, as many yellow-throated wobblers and a ruby-crowned kinglet in one part of the wood near what i took to be an old city reservoir i came upon a single white-throated sparrow and a hummingbird the latter a strangely uncommon sight in tallahassee where of all the places i have ever seen it ought to find itself in clover here too were a pair of carolina wrens just now in search of a building site and conducting themselves exactly in the manner of bluebirds intent on such business, peeping into every hole that offered itself, and then, after the briefest interchange of opinion, unfavorable on the female's part, if we may guess, concluding to look a little farther. As I struck the road again, a man came along on horseback, and we fell into conversation about the country. A lovely country, he called it, and I agreed with him. He inquired where I was from, and I mentioned that I had lately been in southern Florida, and found this region a strong contrast. Yes, he returned, and pointing to the grass, he remarked upon the richness of the soil. This year land would fertilize that, he said, speaking of southern Florida. I shouldn't wonder, said I. I meant to be understood as concurring in his opinion, but such a qualified, Yankee-fied assent seemed to him no assent at all oh it will it will he responded as if the point were one about which i must on no account be left unconvinced he told me that the fine house at which i had looked a little distance back through a long vista of trees 
was the residence of Captain H., who owned all the land along the road for a good distance. I inquired how far the road was pretty like this. For forty miles, he said. That was farther than I was ready to walk, and coming soon to the top of the hill, or more exactly of the plateau, I stopped in the shade of a china tree and looked at the pleasing prospect. Behind me was a plantation of young pear trees, and before me among the hills northward lay broad cultivated slopes, dotted here and there with cabins and tall solitary trees. On the nearer slope, perhaps a sixteenth of a mile away, a negro was ploughing with a single ox harnessed in some primitive manner, with pieces of wood for the most part, as well as I could make out through an opera glass. The soil offered the least possible hindrance, and both he and the ox seemed to be having a literal walk-over. Beyond him, a full half-mile away, perhaps, another man was ploughing with a mule, and in another direction a third was doing likewise, with a woman following in his wake. A colored boy of seventeen, I guessed his age at twenty-three, came up the road in a cart, and I stopped him to inquire about the crops and other matters. The land in front of me was planted with cotton, he said, and the men ploughing in the distance were getting ready to plant the same. They hired the land and the cabins of Captain H., paying him so much cotton, not so much an acre, but so much a mule, if I understood him rightly, by way of rent. We talked a long time about one thing and another. He had been south as far as the Indian River country, but was glad to be back again in Tallahassee, where he was born. I asked him about the road, how far it went. They tell me it goes smack to St. Augustine, he replied. I ain't tried it. It was an unlikely story, it seemed to me, but I was assured afterward that he was right, that the road actually runs across the country from Tallahassee to St. Augustine, a distance of about two hundred miles. With company of my own choosing and in cooler weather, I thought I should like to walk its whole length. My young man was in no haste, with the reins, made of rope after a fashion much followed in Florida. Lying on the forward axle of his cart, he seemed to have put himself entirely at my service. He had to the full that peculiar urbanity which I began after a while to look upon as characteristic of Tallahassee Negroes, a gentleness of speech and a kindly deferential air, neither forward nor servile, such as sits well on any man, whatever the color of his skin. Opening bracket, footnote one. But let no enthusiast set out to walk from one city to the other on the strength of what is here written. After this sketch was first printed in the Atlantic Monthly, a gentleman who ought to know whereof he speaks sent me word that my informants were all of them wrong, that the road does not run to St. Augustine. For myself I assert nothing. As my colored boy said, I ain't tried it. Closing bracket. In that respect, he was like another boy of about his own age who lived in the cabin directly before us, but whom I did not see till I had been several times over the road. Then he happened to be at work near the edge of the field, and I beckoned him to me. He, too, was serious and manly in his bearing, and showed no disposition to go back to his hoe till I broke off the interview, as if it were a point of good manners with him to await my pleasure. Yes, the plantation was a good one and easily cultivated, he said, in response to some remark of my own. There were five in the family, and they all worked. We are all big enough to eat, he added, quite simply. He had never been north, but had lately declined the offer of a gentleman who wished to take him there, him and another fellow. He once went to Jacksonville, but couldn't stay. You can get along without your father pretty well but it's another thing to do without your mother. He never meant to leave home again as long as his mother lived, which was likely to be for some years, I thought, if she were still able to do her part in the cotton field. As a general thing, the colored tenants of the cabins made out pretty well, he believed, unless something happened to the crops. 
as for the old servants of the h family they didn't have to work they were provided for captain h's father left it so in his testimonial i spoke of the purple martins which were flying back and forth over the field with many cheerful noises and of the calabashes that hung from a tall pole in one corner of the cabin yard for their accommodation on my way south i told him i had noticed these dangling long-necked squashes everywhere and had wondered what they were for i had found out since that they were the colored man's martin boxes and was glad to see the people so fond of the birds yes he said there's no danger of hawks carrying off the chickens as long as the martins are round twice afterward as i went up the road i found him ploughing between the cotton rows but he was too far away to be accosted without shouting and i did not feel justified in interrupting him at his work back and forth he went through the long furrow after the patient ox the hens and chickens following no doubt they thought the work was all for their benefit farther away a man and two women were hoeing the family deserved to prosper i said to myself as i lay under a big magnolia tree just beginning to open its large white flowers and idly enjoyed the scene and it was just here by the by that i solved an interesting etymological puzzle to wit the origin and precise meaning of the word bagal a word which the visitor often hears upon the lips of florida people an old hunter in smyrna when i questioned him about it told me that it meant a swampy piece of wood and took its origin he had always supposed from the fact that bay trees and gall bushes commonly grew in such places a tallahassee gentleman agreed with this explanation and promised to bring home some gallberries the next time he came across any that i might see what they were but the berries were never forthcoming and i was none the wiser till on one of my last trips up the st augustine road as i stood under the large magnolia just mentioned a colored man came along hat in hand and a bag of grain balanced on his head that's a large magnolia said i he assented that's about as large as magnolias ever grow isn't it no sir down in the gall there's magnolias a heap bigger than that a gall what's that a bagall sir and what's a bagall a big wood and why do you call it a bagall he was stumped it was plain to see no doubt he would have scratched his head if that useful organ had been accessible he hesitated but it isn't like an uneducated man to confess ignorance cause it's a desert he said a thick place yes yes i answered and he resumed his march the road was travelled mostly by negroes on sunday afternoons it looked quite like a flower garden it was so full of bright dresses coming home from church nowadays folks get religion so easy one young woman said to another as they passed me she was a conservative i did not join the procession but on other days i talked first and last with a good many of the people from the preacher who carried a handsome cane and made me a still handsomer bow down to a serious little fellow of six or seven years whom i found standing at the foot of the hill beside a bundle of dead wood he was carrying it home for the family stove and had set it down for a minute's rest i said something about his burden and as i went on he called after me what kind of birds are you hunting for rice birds i answered that i was looking for birds of all sorts had he seen any rice birds lately yes he said he started a flock the other day up on the hill how did they look said i they is red blackbirds he returned this was not the first time i had heard the red wing called the rice bird but how did the boy know me for a bird gazer that was a mystery it came over me all at once that possibly i had become better known in the community than i had in the least suspected and then i remembered my field-glass that as i could not help being aware was an object of continual attention every day i saw people old and young black and white looking at it with undisguised curiosity 
often they passed audible comments upon it among themselves how far can you see through the spy-glass a bolder spirit would now and then venture to ask and once on the railway track out in the pine lands a barefooted happy-faced urchin made a guess that was really admirable for its ingenuity looks like you're going over inspectin the wire he remarked on rare occasions as an act of special grace i offered such an inquirer a peep through the magic lenses an experiment that never failed to elicit exclamations of wonder things were so near and the observer looked comically incredulous on putting down the glass to find how suddenly the landscape had slipped away again more than one colored man wanted to know its price and expressed a fervent desire to possess one like it and probably if i had ever been assaulted and robbed in all my solitary wanderings through the flat woods and other lonesome places my spy-glass rather than my purse the lust of the eye rather than the pride of life would have been to thank opening bracket footnote one he did not say a pawn any more than northern white boys do closing bracket here however there could be no thought of such a contingency here were no vagabonds one inoffensive yankee specimen excepted but hard-working people going into the city or out again each on his own lawful business scarcely one of them man or woman but greeted me kindly one a white man on horseback invited and even urged me to mount his horse and let him walk a piece i must be fatigued he was sure how could i help it and he would as soon walk as not finding me obstinate he walked his horse at my side chatting about the country the trees and the crops he it was who called my particular attention to the abundance of blackberry vines are the berries sweet i asked he smacked his lips sweet as honey and big as that measuring off a liberal portion of his thumb i spoke of them half an hour later to a middle-aged colored man yes he said the blackberries were plenty enough and sweet enough but for his part he didn't trouble them a great deal the vines and he pointed at them fringing the roadside indefinitely were great places for rattlesnakes he liked the berries but he liked somebody else to pick them he was awfully afraid of snakes they were so dangerous yes sir this in answer to an inquiry there are plenty of rattlesnakes here clean up to christmas i liked him for his frank avowal of cowardice and still more for his quiet bearing he remembered the days of slavery before the surrender as the current southern phrase is and his face beamed when i spoke of my joy in thinking that his people were free no matter what might befall them he too raised cotton on hired land and was bringing up his children there were eight of them he said to habits of industry my second stroll toward st augustine carried me perhaps three miles say one sixty-sixth of the entire distance and none of my subsequent excursions took me any farther and having just now commended a negro for his candor i am moved to acknowledge that between the sand underfoot and the sun overhead i found the six miles which i spent at least four hours in accomplishing more fatiguing than twice that distance would have been over new hampshire hills if i were to settle in that country i should probably fall into the way of riding more and walking less i remember thinking how comfortable a certain ponderous black mammy looked whom i met on one of these same sunny and sandy tramps she sat in the very middle of a tip cot with an old and truly picturesque man's hat on her head quite in the fashion feminine readers will notice driving a one-horned ox with a pair of clothes-line reins she was travelling slowly just as i like to travel and as i say i was impressed by her comfortable appearance why would not an equipage like that be just the thing for a naturalistic idler not far beyond my halting place of two days before i came to a cherokee rose-bush 
one of the most beautiful of plants white fragrant single roses real roses set in the midst of the handsomest of glossy green leaves i was delighted to find it still in flower a hundred miles farther south i had seen it finishing its season a full month earlier i stopped of course to pluck a blossom at that moment a female redbird flew out of the bush her mate was beside her instantly and a nameless something in their manner told me they were trying to keep a secret the nest built mainly of pine needles and other leaves was in the middle of the bush a foot or two from the grass and contained two bluish or greenish eggs thickly spattered with dark brown i meant to look into it again the owners seemed to have no great objection but somehow missed it every time i passed from that point as far as i went the road was lined with cherokee roses not continuously but with short intermissions and from the number of redbirds seen almost invariably in pairs i feel safe in saying that the nest i had found was probably one of fifteen or twenty scattered along the wayside how gloriously the birds sang it was their day for singing i was ready to christen the road anew red bird road but the red birds many and conspicuous as they were had no monopoly of the road or of the day house wrens were equally numerous and equally at home though they sang more out of sight red-eyed chewinks still far from their native berry pastures hopped into a bush to cry who's he at the passing of a stranger in whom for aught i know they may have half recognized an old acquaintance a bunch of quails ran across the road a little in front of me and in another place fifteen or twenty red-winged blackbirds not a red wing among them sat gossiping in a tree-top elsewhere even later than this it was now april seventh i saw flocks every bird of which wore shoulder straps like the traditional militia company all officers they did not gossip of course it is the male that sports the red but they made a lively noise as for the mockingbirds they were at the front here as they were everywhere during my fortnight in tallahassee there were never many consecutive five minutes of daylight in which if i stopped to listen i could not hear at least one mocker oftener two or three were singing at once in as many different directions and speaking of them i must speak also of their more northern cousin from the day i entered florida i had been saying that the mockingbird save for his occasional mimicry of other birds sang so exactly like the thrasher that i did not believe i could tell one from the other now however on this st augustine road i suddenly became aware of a bird singing somewhere in advance and as i listened again i said aloud with full persuasion there that's a thrasher there was something of a difference a shade of coarseness in the voice perhaps a tendency to force the tone as we say of human singers a something at all events and the longer i hearkened the more confident i felt that the bird was a thrasher and so it was the first one i had heard in florida although i had seen many probably the two birds have peculiarities of voice and method that with longer familiarity on the listener's part would render them easily distinguishable on general principles i must believe that to be true of all birds but the experience just described is not to be taken as proving that i have any such familiarity within a week afterward while walking along the railway i came upon a thrasher and a mockingbird singing side by side the mocker upon a telegraph pole and the thrasher on the wire halfway between the mocker and the next pole they sang and sang while i stood between them in the cut below and listened and if my life had depended on my seeing how one song differed from the other i could not have done it with my eyes shut the birds might have changed places if they could have done it quickly enough and i should have been none the wiser <laughs> 
As I have said, I followed the road over the nearly level plateau for what I guessed to be about three miles. Then I found myself in a bit of a hollow that seemed made for a stopping place, with a plantation road running off to the right and a hillside cornfield of many acres on the left. In the field were a few tall dead trees. At the tip of one sat a sparrowhawk, and to the trunk of another clung a red-bellied woodpecker who with characteristic foolish sat beside his hole calling persistently and then as if determined to publish what other birds so carefully conceal went inside thrust out his head and resumed his clatter here too were a pair of bluebirds noticeable for their rarity and for the wonderful color a shade deeper than is ever seen at the north i think of the male's blue coat in a small thicket in the hollow beside the road were noisy white-eyed vireos, a ruby-crowned kinglet, a tiny thing that within a month would be singing in Canada or beyond, an unseen wood peewee, and, also unseen, a hermit thrush, one of perhaps twenty solitary individuals that I found scattered about the woods in the course of my journeyings. Not one of them sang a note. Probably they did not know that there was a Yankee in Florida who, in some moods at least, would have given more for a dozen bars of hermit thrush music than for a day and a night of the mockingbird's medley. Not that I mean to disparage the great southern performer. As a vocalist, he is so far beyond the hermit thrush as to render a comparison absurd. But what I love is a singer, a voice to reach the soul an old tallahassee negro near the white norman school so he called it hit off the mockingbird pretty well i had called his attention to one singing in an adjacent dooryard yes he said i love to hear em they's very amusin very amusin my own feeling can hardly be a prejudice conscious or unconscious in favor of what has grown dear to me through early and long continued association the difference between the music of birds like the mocker, the thrasher, and the catbird, and that of birds like the hermit, the veery, and the wood thrush is one of a kind, not of degree. And I have heard music of the mocking bird's kind, the thrashers, that is to say, as long as I have heard music at all. The question is one of taste, it is true, but it is not a question of familiarity or favoritism. All praise to the mocker and the thrasher. May their tribe increase. But if we are to indulge in comparisons, give me the wood thrush, the hermit, and the veery, with tones that the mockingbird can never imitate, and a simplicity which the fates, the wise fates who will have variety, have put forever beyond his appreciation and his reach. Florida, as I saw it, let the qualification be noted, is no more a land of flowers than new england in some respects indeed it is less so flowering shrubs and climbers there are in abundance i rode in the cars through miles on miles of flowering dogwood and pink azalea here on this tallahassee road were miles of cherokee roses with plenty of the climbing scarlet honeysuckle beloved of hummingbirds although i saw none here and near the city as already described masses of lantana and white honeysuckle in more than one place pink double roses vagrants from cultivated grounds no doubt offered buds and blooms to all who would have them a cross vine bignonia less free-handed hung its showy bells out of reach in the treetops thorn bushes of several kinds were in flower a puzzling lot and the tree-like blueberry vaccinium arboreum loaded with its large flaring white corollas was a real spectacle of beauty here likewise i found one tiny crab-apple shrub with a few blossoms exquisitely tinted with rose color and most exquisitely fragrant but the new englander when he talks of wild flowers has in his eyes something different from these he is not thinking of any bush no matter how beautiful but of trailing arbutus hepaticus bloodroot anemones saxifrage 
violets, dog-tooth violets, spring beauties, cowslips, buttercups, cordialis, columbine, Dutchman's breeches, clintonia, five-finger, and all the rest of that bright and fragrant host which ever since he can remember he has seen covering his native hills and valleys with the return of May. It is not meant, of course, that plants like these are wholly wanting in Florida. I remember an abundance of violets, blue and white, especially in the flat woods, where also I often found pretty butterworts of two or three sorts. The smaller blue ones took very acceptably the place of hepaticus, and indeed I heard them called by that name. But as compared with what one sees in New England, such ground flowers, flowers which it seems perfectly natural to pluck for a nosegay, were very little in evidence. I heard northern visitors remark the fact again and again. On this pretty road out of Tallahassee, itself a city of flower gardens, I can recall nothing of the kind except half a dozen strawberry blossoms, and the oxalis and specularia before mentioned. Probably the round-leaved Housatonia grew here, as it did everywhere, in small scattered patches. If there were violets as well, I can only say I have forgotten them. He had added, however, that at the time I did not miss them. In a garden of roses one does not begin by sighing for mignonette and the lilies of the valley. Violets or no violets, there was no lack of beauty. The southern highway surveyor, if such a personage exists, is evidently not consumed by that distressing puritanical passion for slicking up things, which too often makes of his northern brother something scarcely better than a public nuisance. At the South you will not find a woman cultivating with pain a few exotics beside the front door, while her husband is mowing and burning the far more attractive wild garden that nature has planted just outside the fence. The St. Augustine Road, at any rate, after climbing the hill and getting beyond the wood, runs between natural hedges, trees, vines, and shrubs carelessly intermingled, not dense enough to conceal the prospect or shut out the breeze, straight from the gulf, as the Tallahasseean is careful to inform you, but sufficient to afford much welcome protection from the sun. Here it was good to find the sassafras growing side by side with the persimmon, although when for old acquaintance' sake I put a leaf into my mouth, I was half glad to fancy it a thought less savory than some I had tasted in Yankee land. I took a kind of foolish satisfaction, too, in the obvious fact that certain plants, the sumac and the Virginia creeper, to mention no others, were less at home here than a thousand miles farther north. With the wild cherry trees, I was obliged to confess the case was reversed. I had seen larger ones in Massachusetts, perhaps, but none that looked half so clean and thrifty. In truth, their appearance was a puzzle rum cherry trees as by all tokens they undoubtedly were till of a sudden it flashed upon me that there were no caterpillars nests in them then i ceased to wonder at their odd look it spoke well for my botanical acumen that i had recognized them at all before i had been a week in tallahassee i found that without forethought or plan i had dropped into the habit and how pleasant it is to think that some good habits can be dropped into, of making the St. Augustine Road my after-dinner sauntering place. The morning was for a walk, to Lake Bradford perhaps, in search of a mythical ivory-billed woodpecker, or westward on the railway for a few miles, with a view to rare migratory wobblers. But in the afternoon I did not walk, I loitered, and though I still minded the birds and flowers, I for the most part forgot my botany and ornithology. In the cool of the day, then, the phrase is an innocent euphemism, I climbed the hill, and after an hour or two on the plateau strolled back again, facing the sunset through a vista of moss-covered live oaks and sweet gums. Those quiet and curious hours are among the pleasantest of all my Florida memories. A cuckoo would be cooing, perhaps, or a quail, with cheerful ambiguity, 
such as belongs to weather predictions in general, would be prophesying more wet and no more wet in alternate breaths, or two or three nighthawks would be sweeping back and forth high above the valley, or a marsh hawk would be quartering over the big oat field. The martins would be cackling, in any event, and the kingbirds practicing their aerial mock somersaults, and the mockingbird would be singing, and the redbird whistling. On the western slope, just below the oat field, the northern woman who owned the pretty cottage there, the only one on the road, was sure to be at work among her flowers. A laughing colored boy who did chores for her, without injury to his health I could warrant, told me that she was a northerner, but I knew it already. I needed no witness but her beds of petunias. In the valley as I crossed the railroad track, a loggerhead shrike sat, almost, of course, on the telegraph wire in dignified silence, and just beyond among the cabins I had my choice of mockingbirds and orchard orioles. And so, admiring the roses and the pomegranates, the lantanas and the honeysuckles, or chatting with some dusky fellow pilgrim, I mounted the hill to the city, and likely as not saw before me a red-headed woodpecker sitting on the roof of the state house, calling attention to his patriotic self in his tricolored dress by occasional vigorous tattoos on the tinned ridge pole. I never saw him there without gladness. The legislature had begun its session in an economical mood, as is more or less the habit of legislatures, I believe, and was even considering a proposition to reduce the salary and mileage of its members. Under such circumstances it ought not to have been a matter of surprise, perhaps, that no flag floated from the cupola of the capital. The people's money should not be wasted, and possibly I should never have remarked the omission but for a certain curiosity, natural if not inevitable, on the part of a northern visitor as to the real feeling of the south toward the national government day after day i had seen a portly gentleman with an air or with airs as a spectator might choose to express it going in and out of the state house gate dressed ostentatiously in a suit of confederate gray he had worn nothing else since the war i was told but of course the state of florida was not to be judged by the freak of one man and he only a member of the third house. And even when I went into the governor's office and saw the original ordinance of secession hanging in a conspicuous place on the wall as if it were an heirloom to be proud of, I felt no stirring of sectional animosity. Thoroughbred Massachusetts Yankee and old-fashioned abolitionist as I am, a brave people can hardly be expected or desired to forget its history especially when that history has to do with sacrifices and heroic deeds. But these things taken together did no doubt prepare me to look upon it as a happy coincidence when, one morning, I heard the familiar cry of the red-headed woodpecker for the first time in Florida and looked up to see him flying the national colors from the ridgepole of the State House. I did not break out with three cheers for the red, white, and blue, I am naturally undemonstrative, but I said to myself that Melanerpes erythrocephalus was a very handsome bird. End of chapter 7 Recording by James O'Connor Randolph, Massachusetts, November 2009